a lot of us are friends in San Diego just because it's such a small community. So I play poker and hang out with these guys all the time and many people in this audience. So great to see old friends and meet some of the new ones. Um, I've been in this business for a long time, since about 2002. I'm here in my capacity as an owner of a construction company, California Home Company. We go by Cal Home Co. You can find us on Instagram at California Home Company and see some of the stuff we're doing. Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. I mean, I can, we can only speak anecdotally, but yeah, I mean, in the fact that you, you see it on every single listing. ADU potential. Well, that's because every single house has ADU potential. So now you're gonna start seeing listings with SB9 potential, right? Split the 6,000 square foot lot into a two, 3,000 square foot lots and build a bunch more houses. Uh, and, and you know, I, I follow the market a little closer in Pacific Beach, just up the street, because I live there. And so I see now single family lots that used to sell for 1.1 million, now selling for 2 million. So, the short answer is yes. I've seen at least a half dozen houses in the last year where there've been informal agreements between neighbors over years. And I'm like, oh, let me just use this for my garden. And next thing you know, there's a fence. And now the boundaries are ambiguous. Um, even my aunt, my wife's aunt in Mission Hills had a multi-year dispute over a five foot dis discrepancy on the, on the boundary. And she lost because it was prevailing use for so long. It was kind of like, uh, you know, uh, obvious and notorious use for so long that she lost her five feet. Uh, so it's worth a few thousand dollars to get the survey and know exactly where your boundary is because they've got the markers out and they've got the, the things that you can find out, put the flags in and figure it out. Uh, we've even done ADUs and, you know, not with Kalani, but with other designers where they just did the lot survey based on Google Maps and it was off by feet, <laughs> by off by feet. And, and then, you know, um, it's tough because we're the face of who's out there working. We're like, sorry, this is off by four feet. Um, we have to go back to the drawing board. It's going to take you next three months, right? I mean, that's a bad conversation to have. So get the survey. They, they are requiring one parking spot for the new development on the house, unless you're in a transit area, which pretty much all of San Diego is in a transit area. So, so pretty much you don't, yeah, if you're near a bus line or half a mile within a bus line, you don't need parking. Um, and so that you don't need parking for the, for the most part. I mean, it's nice to have a spot or some storage or something, but uh, they don't require it anymore. I mean, you know, just as reference, there's a lot of NIMBYs in the county and in the area that always want things the way they used to be 20 years ago, and that ship sailed, you know? So just for relative perspective, New York has a, a density of 40,000 people per mile. Does anyone know what it is for San Diego? We're at 4,000. We're, we're, we're about one-tenth of what New York City is. So, and, and you know, compared to any other coastal city, we're probably the least dense city on the West Coast by far. Being on the planning group and reviewing hundreds of plans uh, at the discretionary level, we see the benefit to CEQA, right? I mean, especially if you have to care a little bit about the trees and the rodents and, you know, endangered insects that live there, it's kind of nice to know what's going to be the impact of my development for this bigger thing. What's that? Yeah, I mean, you see this with the runoff and stuff. You have to be kind of conscious of that. Like, where's this water going? And so having all of those kind of things assessed and understood has a benefit. They put it in place because you kind of have to protect our planet a little bit. So it's not like just burn and, and build. You kind of have to keep track of the trees and the animals a little bit. So I think it's a benefit to have it. I know it's an expensive process. It can take years, especially, you know, if you're on a canyon or something like that, it's difficult. Um, but there's a reason for it, is what I would argue. You know, just planning for, for the construction side, we have regular meetings with our clients when they're picking their flooring and their cabinets and their appliances and their light fixtures. And the biggest thing right now is please pick stuff that's in stock. <laughs> please pick, because they'll say it's a one month delivery and that one month turns into six months and we'll have everything done. And we're like, sorry, you don't have a stove and a refrigerator because it's on a ship in Long Beach right now, right? So uh, right now that's the biggest challenge is and there's plenty of stuff that's available, so just making that plan, ordering ahead. And we had that conversation today. She's like, how come we need to pick the cabinets this early? I was like, yeah, because it takes two months to make the custom cabinets, but what if they're delayed by a month or two? I'd rather have them early, and we've got them waiting in our storeroom, versus you waiting for us and saying, why aren't my cabinets ready? So get stuff ordered ahead of time, plan it out, uh, and, just, and just have that coordinated ahead of time. So you're ordering stuff in stock or you know it's gonna be there when you're ready to build because last thing you wanna do is hurry up and wait. Yeah, we, I mean, I, you kind of see it following the same format as the ADU where they keep loosening it and they, they're, you know, this is one of those things where they kind of soften the blow to all the NIMBY people um, where, where they're saying, no, it's not gonna be that bad. And then they kind of just make it a little bit easier every six to nine months. 
says we need housing and we need less regulation. And you keep hearing repeatedly that California is a hard place to build because of all the red tape and you could build for 40% cheaper just off of red tape in Texas, right? I mean, so that's a big thing. So that's why they're trying to skip the discretionary approval and just get through things ministerial because that adds a lot of cost that we can save. Um, same with the diff fees. I mean, those are important for the city, but saving uh, you know, $11,000 per unit on ADUs, that money's got to come from somewhere. Um, but you know, to encourage building and to encourage affordability, even in Birdland, I saw a house going for $1,000 a foot, right? I mean, so it's, it's gotten to where it's already been silly. It just keeps getting sillier. So we have to build more houses to, to bring the pricing, at least slow down the appreciation, right? My argument with people is you can't afford not to start building one right now, right? You can't afford not to because you're not making 12 to 15% on anything else, right? Buying, buying properties, I mean, commercial properties trade at two and a half to 4%. So, I mean, that's because you have to buy the land and then you're taking on someone else. So that, you know, with the earlier question about the appreciation on lots, people are starting to factor that in, that potential cap rate of building additional units for that land value. Uh, versus you already own the land, you've got some space in your backyard or above your garage or in your easements, let's build some units there because that's where it's the most affordable to build and you're building at half or a third of the cost of price per square foot for retail value for purchasing properties in that area. The most common question I got is, what's your price per square foot to build? And that's kind of like going and needing to get surgery and asking for the cheapest doctor in the area. Like it's just a bad idea to do surgery on your house with the cheapest person around. Um, so don't do that. You know, there's better ways to figure this out is to check their references, check how they handle change orders. Are they spending time doing detailed proposals that include allowances for every window and door and light fixture that you've got? Or are they just kind of ballparking and hoping they get it right? Because that's when you get these horror stories from contractors saying, oh, my original bid was 100, and then it ended up costing 250. And what was I gonna do? I was handcuffed to it, right? So uh, those are those same people who say, no, the bid's gonna be 220. And they're like, no, it's our other contractor bid half as much. And I was like, let's see if they finish at that job at that price. So uh, keep that in mind, having a detailed proposal ahead of time, checking the references to see how they handle change orders or if they had a bunch of them, if they're reading the plans in detail to know that you've got arched entryways instead of just squared, because that makes a big cost difference, is going to be important. So that's why we spend, you know, three, four, five hours doing our proposals detailed and we don't exceed those, right? And so that's a big difference versus someone says, yeah, I could build this for 200 a foot, I think, and hopefully I don't use nails at rust in, in the next year, right? And so there's a lot of nuance to it. So don't, don't try to buy the cheapest car, don't buy the cheapest contractor, don't buy the cheapest anything, you get what you pay for.